Welcome to AASHTO Resource Q&A. We're taking time to discuss construction materials, testing, and inspection with people in the know. From exploring testing problems and solutions to laboratory best practices and quality management, we're covering topics important to you. Now, here's our host, Brian Johnson. Welcome to AASHTO Resource q and I'm Brian Johnson. And I'm Kim Swanson, and we have another one of those PSP Insights episodes, and I'm actually pretty excited about this one. What are we talking about today, Brian? Well, this week, we are going to talk about a few samples that just came out, including the Asphalt Mixture Design Marshall sample and the Design Veeam samples, which we're going to get into that it was one sample that was divided into three parts. Now it is three separate samples. And with us to talk about it are three Ashto Resource employees who know something about it. First and foremost, uh, John Molusky, Director of the Proficiency Sample Program. Welcome, John. Hey, thanks, Brian. Glad to be here for another one of these. And then we have Ryan LeQuay, position unremembered by me, Laboratory and Testing Manager. There you go. With Ashto Resource. Thanks, Brian. We'll get there thanks eventually. For, thanks for coming. Every Ryan. episode. I'll we've remember done how many it's, of it's these? It's tradition now. So you know, I I know Ryan to see him. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope so. He's been here for ten years. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then last, we've got Joe Williams. Hey, Brian. Senior thanks quality for having analyst. me on again. Yeah, senior quality analyst. He is our gatekeeper for all proficiency sample policies for the Ashto accreditation program and generally knowledgeable person about these sort of things. Brian, well, you should feel a little bit better because at least Brian hesitated when he went over Joe's position and yeah. you know, Joe specifically works in app. So <laughs> <laughs> I did. That was for dramatic effect. Yes. <laughs> it's because I've transcended the role of senior quality analyst. Nobody knows what my position I am. That is true. <laughs> Joe does a lot more than what the garden variety senior quality analysts would do. Actually, none of them are garden variety. They all have specialties. They're and heirlooms. Just, yes, they are heirloom. Is that, should that be a new position title? Heirloom <laughs> quality analyst? I like it, John. Good job. You get credit for that one. Okay, so back to the matter at hand. Let's talk about proficiency samples. First, we'll talk about the boring one. The Marshall design sample, that I say boring because it has been around forever. And you would really think that everybody would have this test down by now, but we still do get some suspensions. Let's talk about anything that might have been interesting with this particular design sample. We'll go to Ryan. Nothing super interesting on this design sample. We make up the the mixed design beforehand and try and come up with you know, unique unique enough specimens there. So all we really have to talk about with this one is how well we did in lab in development compared to the actual results. You know, Nothing we did like giving yourself a pat on the back, Ryan. <laughs> hey, we got it. Someone's got to, you know, give us kudos when we can get them. Uh, so this was a team effort with me and John. But you know, if we do a, if we look at our own ratings, compare our our data compared to what was you know sent back, we got fives and fours. Wasn't it the last episode that we did about this that you say you always are do lower or yeah, something? So and so yeah, yeah, so that's the one with the the liquid asphalt specific mm -hmm. gravity. Um, we're always a little skewed off, but this one, you know, our maximum gravity, our bulk specific gravity, pretty close to the money. Interesting though, our specimen heights were higher than what was reported back. Um, so I was actually going to look back on our, our previous sample, see if that was a trend, uh, maybe in development. We have to shoot a little more higher than we think we do. Well, that's interesting. So the, our, you're saying our, your specimen heights, when you compacted your own specimens, were higher? Mm -hmm. All right, let's diagnose that problem. Sure. Uh, Joe, you deal with a lot of low ratings. If you had a laboratory that, that had uh, specimens that were coming in high, higher than the average, and they said it, Boy, we're really having a hard time figuring out what might have gone wrong. What do you think might have gone wrong there, Joe? Could be a couple of different things. You got to remember that it's not just the compaction, it's the measurement itself. So they could be measuring a little off. Maybe their hammer's a little light, maybe a little worn out. Maybe their batching's a little bit off. Could be a couple of different things. I mean, there's a lot to look at there. You know, sometimes it's just a matter of, of, of bad luck, to be honest with you. I mean, they got to do you know, all of their corrective action stuff and root cause analysis. But if everything they look at in the past, you know, from 
they typically do well and then they look at this sample and they didn't do too well you know kind of and they can't find anything sometimes you can just chalk it up to bad luck and anomaly and then kind of wait till next year's sample and see if see if something else turns up i think you're getting jaded looking at all these corrective actions where they didn't look hard enough joe i'm gonna, I'm gonna throw a little wrinkle in here i would totally agree with you 100 percent if our air voids were higher than everybody else's but our air voids are actually below the average okay and our specimens are higher and your heights were higher mm, yeah see so look at this is just all kinds of crazy that's now that's interesting i'm sure so you just have no idea what you're doing no we just don't know how to run the market <laughs> that's what it comes yeah. down so to for those that maybe are not super familiar with the sample you're saying john be, because your specimens were higher that you would expect you would also have high more air voids or bigger air voids or whatever the right term is to help increase it but because yours are lower then it's like two things that are like puzzling to you is that did i restate that correctly for not knowing what you're talking about yeah either that or we're screwing up our bulk specific gravity that's the only other option we could be doing something wrong with our SSD mass or our immersed mass. I would imagine it's probably the SSD mass where we're, you know, we obviously don't do it as much as other laboratories do. So we might have a little bit of bias um, because we, you know, do these mixed designs basically two months a year. That was my thought when I looked at the numbers that maybe we have a little bit of variation in our in our bulk density values. So that makes sense, I think. Maybe. Um, I'm, I lied. It doesn't make sense to me, but I'm sure that makes sense to some people. But I want to put people's, uh, our listeners' minds at ease that it doesn't really matter what our internal ratings were. That is not, has nothing to do with the way that ratings and the statistic analysis that you do once you get the ratings. So it doesn't really matter. It just helps you for the design mix purposes. Am I correct in that? Yeah, that's correct. It's consensus based. So we don't use the Ashto resource design as the reference method, but it just gives us a little bit of, of support and backing to say that we're still doing the test methods in accordance with them and we're we're doing reasonably well. So we're happy and it, it's actually quite a bit of work. You know, it, it's just like a mixed design from a, a laboratory who's doing total design work right from the get go. Everything goes into it, you know, aggregate calculations, sieve analyses, specific gravities, um, we go through the whole deal just like any other laboratory would to get these mixed designs. And we try to do our best to make sure that they actually meet the specifications. So they would be put down on a road, hit an easel requirement, and look at the voids in mineral aggregate, voids filled with asphalt, dust to binder ratio, the whole shebang, just like everybody else. So I, I think might be speaking for Ryan here a little bit as well, but it kind of feels good when we go through all this work and we get numbers that are comparable to everybody else. That is pretty good, considering that you don't do it all the time. You're, you're messing around with this once a year, really. But it's like there are a ton of things that can go wrong. I mean, you guys all mentioned some, but you know, you could have your aggregate not dry enough. You're, you're weighing moisture instead of actual aggregate. You could have too much asphalt binder. You could have the temperatures are wrong on compaction. Temperatures are wrong on mixing get the blow count wrong on the on the Marshall hammer it just goes on and on you could have issues with the balance uh, and then and what John was saying is it could even be something not related to the actual Marshall compaction it could be that air void calculate you know one of the factors that goes into the air void calculation that could be throwing a, a fake clue at you you know this whole concept of it was coming out high but the air voids were lower well, what if that had nothing to do with the actual compaction of the specimen? It was something related to the one of the tests, uh, either the maximum specific gravity or the bulk specific gravity. So it goes on and on. Now, looking at this, John, let, let's talk about how we make these samples for the Marshall. When the laboratory gets this, so somebody's not enrolled in this program, what do they get and what do they have to do? So each laboratory will receive the sample box and it's basically all of the raw material. Nothing is pre-mixed, nothing's prefabricated. The material is prepared by the Ashto Resource Proficiency Sample Program crew. We order, for example, the aggregate, it comes in in the Ashto or ASTM, um, you know, stone size 67, 57, whatever it is. We sieve it through our processing screens. Uh, we run it through some sieve checks on our own to make sure that we're hitting specific requirements. And then the material is bagged separately by size fraction. So we'll send a bag of half inch, a bag of three eighth, 
a bag of number four, a bag of number eight, and a bag of sand. And the sand is all minus number eight. If the mix design that Ryan and I work up requires mineral filler because we need to add a little bit more passing to 200, we'll include mineral filler in the mix design and have a separate baggie for, for that. Then we'll also sand a can of liquid asphalt. And basically you get the batching instructions and you, you mix it just like you're making a recipe. We tell you the exact amount of aggregate to add in each size fraction and the amount of asphalt. Mix it up by hand. Um, your first mix is a butter batch, so you can toss that out of your bowl and use it for your rice. And then once you got your bowl buttered, you prepare three compaction specimens and get after it. We actually do have an unboxing video that kind of shows all of the materials that uh, laboratories are sent. So that might be interesting to some people if you haven't seen that um, to go to our YouTube channel. I'll put a link in our show notes as well. Yeah. And John, what do you tell people if they don't customarily mix their own specimens? I'm sure you get that question sometimes. Yeah, we do. It's, it's a little bit challenging. Marshall's not so bad because the samples are so small. Uh, but when it comes to the gyratory specimens, it's kind of tricky just because they're so much larger. You know, but unfortunately, if your laboratory is compacting for Marshall and you, you do not have the testing for cores, you know, the accreditation component um, where you're testing specific cores of asphalt, then you're going to be required to mix and, and uh, perform your rice testing. So, yeah, unfortunately, you just got to do it. Kind of stinks to do it by hand, but uh, it is what it is. Yeah, let's talk about those proficiency sample rules for accreditation, Joe. What does somebody <laughs> need to know about? when they're testing the Marshall sample, if they're also accredited for some of those tests that are included? I think there's two things of interest here. One is that none of our proficiency sample programs include a T275 or D1188, which is bulk specific gravity using paraffin or parafilm. I'm not sure if I've got the order of that right. Uh, one, one's one and one's the other. So if a laboratory were to get low ratings on T166 and D2726, the bulk specific gravity test, those tests would be suspended as well because they're essentially the same test, except you're using paraffin or par parafilm in that testing. And again, just, just a reminder that suspensions come from low ratings, which we consider, which the low ratings we look at are zeros or ones on both samples for a single line item two years in a row. So really, it's it takes four samples of low ratings to take a suspension. So just a reminder real quick. Um, the other interesting one there is the, the height of the specimen taken by in accordance with D3549. If a suspension were to take place there, then also the accreditation for R68 and or D6926 would be suspended. And, and the reason for that is we don't really have a way to know how those low ratings came to be. Was it the compaction effort? Was it the measurement itself? So those two are, are suspended. The, the compaction effort and the measurement are suspended in conjunction if low ratings are received on the height measurement. All right. So those are the tricky ones. Otherwise, you've got air voids, right? Yeah, air voids, specific gravity, stability and flow, they're all pretty standard in how we review, review those. Those are kind of the, the only two sort of little tricky ones that a laboratory might if, if a suspension were to take place, they would say, whoa, you know, I'm accredited for paraffin bulk specific gravity, and that's not even this sample. Why, is, why am I suspended for that? And that's that's the reason why. Yeah, and I know we don't have the results out yet for the list of laboratories that are getting suspended this round uh, as we're recording this. But in general, in your experience, what tests are the most challenging? What What ones end up getting suspended more than not? Any of the compaction ones, um, maximum specific gravity seems to be a big one that gets suspended. And, and specific to Marshall, uh, we see stability and flow get suspended a good bit. And again, like you just said, we haven't gotten the list yet. But uh, another reminder, a lot of our suspensions come in conjunction in some part with a laboratory missing around or not submitting data for a specific test. So Get, you know, make time, make time to test your samples and, and get the data and to uh, avoid any suspensions down the road. Even if you might think, oh, I've got this one chance. If I don't submit it this year, I'm fine. Because then if something happens the next year, then you're then you're getting that suspension. So good advice as always, Joe. Now let's talk about the beam sample. John, tell us what has happened this year with the beam round. 
So this year we made the move to separate the veem samples by the method of compaction for ever, essentially. The methods were combined or the methods of compaction were combined into one sample round. That doesn't mean the data was all pooled together. We still separate everything by compaction. But, you know, in looking back at the information that we would provide to the laboratories, the data sheets, instructions, um, announcement letter, the whole situation was very, very confusing. We would have essentially seven pages of instructions, pages like two and three were for California, three and four or four and five were for Texas and six and seven were for Colorado. Each one has a slightly different mix design based off the amount of material that's needed. So it just ended up being a lot more chances just for errors and mistakes, just because of the nature of the way that the instructions were and the whole round um, phased itself out. So we decided to separate the three methods by our three compaction methods and just run three separate samples. It didn't really uh, have too much of an effect on anything from a production standpoint. I think the biggest thing was more uh, on the, the end of Ryan and myself with having to create the new sample rounds in the database. But uh, for the proficiency sample crew it was really just printing out a few different labels and labeling boxes and bags a little bit differently. Um, but beyond that, I, I think it seems like it made a lot of sense. We have not, I, I just, actually Ryan and I took a peek at the data sheet comments and feedback this morning. And for, this is one of the first years where we did not have any negative feedback on the instructions and clarity of them. So that was a, a huge, a uh, huge thing to take care of. So, you know, continual improvement, that's what we're all about. Um, you know, we took feedback from all the participants and actually made a change that appears to be meaningful right now. Are all of the labs, regardless of sample type, are they essentially sent the same sample? Essentially, yeah. Yeah, yeah? okay. Everything is still based on the same design. It's just proportionalized differently. Even yeah. though the compaction effort is different, now, it's obviously way different for something like the gyratory shear and the Colorado foreign or foreign gyratory because they're a completely different compaction effort. You know, kneading compactor is a little bit more similar to Marshall, right? You have that, you know, that constant blow or whatever the blow count specifically with a certain amount of pressure. And I know the gyratory does as well, but when you're looking at the, you know, a, a certain pressure, but when you're talking about the Texas gyratory and the Colorado, you actually have a gyration. It's not a kneading or, you know, straight blow count or blow effort, uh, axial effort. So there is going to be a difference. And, uh, you know, Ryan, I think you were looking at some of that stuff this morning to see how the things, how it was comparable to one another. Especially now that they're broken apart, we can see how the results compare apples to oranges to pears, as it were. You can't compare all the the results, but you can compare your maximum gravity, your your bulk gravity, uh, and your percent air voids, and they're all in the general ballpark of each other. For example, maximum specific gravity for California in factor two point six zero for Texas two point six zero rounded for Colorado two point six one for the bulks two four nine two five one two five two. So again, all in that same ballpark. Uh, the one thing that we found interesting the percent air voids. So for Colorado and Texas, those are both around 3.36, 3.41. So 3.4. California, 4.4%. So it just shows the difference in the machines there, essentially, how it's compacting. How'd the Veeam stability look, Ryan, if you got that data pulled up? Because that's that's one thing, right? We've got three different compaction methods. Yeah. And the air voids are different, but we're, it's interesting, right? So it makes sense that all of the maximum specific gravities are the same, right? It's the right. same mix design, the same proportion, the asphalt content's the same. So those should be very, very close. Mm, Bulks yeah. are going to be slightly different, but the real interesting thing should be the the stability. So all of our stability worked out really well. Um, this is our first time trying it with these samples. Across all three, let me pull them up here and make sure real quick. Um but they all came in pretty much right on or very near to the control line. You're talking about the stability value. Mm. So is oh, that the, sorry. The, the one S stability value? Our stability or the sample? What did the average stability values look like when you compare Colorado, Texas, and oh. California? 
All right, well, all right. Reset. Because right, you have three different again. compaction efforts. Yep. Sorry, I'm used to stability in a different sense. Not Veeam so, stability. Yeah. So they are uncorrected. We got a little bit. Of, we got decent enough difference. So California uh, average value is around 38. Colorado average value is around 42. And Texas around 48. Correction doesn't add too much there. So, uh, yeah, so definitely a little bit difference there between the three. Yeah, and you didn't get much feedback from anybody about whether they felt like that was a expected result. Because usually, I assume, when you've got results that very different, uh, you know, far from what they're used to, they usually tell you about it, right? Often and loudly, yes. Right, right, yeah. I've heard that with some of the soil uh, mm-hmm. feedback at times from yeah. different parts of the country. Since I don't know what you're talking about, why would that test for stability, why would that differ based on the compaction method where some of the other ones would be the same? Uh, it's just the amount of effort that's used to compact the sample and put it in that mold. You know, they all have a different force applied and a different way that they get the material in the mold. Like I, I mentioned, you know, needing compactor just basically presses it into the mold. The gyratory presses it, but with an angle and an oscillation or gyration. So as it goes into the mold differently, it's going to have, you know, different viscosity, different effort, and it, sh- it should make it uh, make it change a little bit. Thank you for that clarification, because I was lost. It's correlated to strength, right? It's related to how tightly those connections are made, you know, like how together are those specimens after compaction and you've got a lot more oscillating action going on i guess that's oscillating is not the right term gyrating that, that gyrating or kneading or you have a better chance of getting those particles to lock together a little better i guess which is kind of what i was i was not surprised to hear that the air voids were higher on the california kneading compactor because of the difference between how that is with that kind of press and hold method of compaction the, and, and it often looks a little fluffier as it's compacting compared to the two methods of gyratory compaction. I would have expected those to be a little bit more densely compacted, but I was surprised to hear the results of the stability numbers, but maybe that's because I'm thinking about that the wrong way. What were those numbers again, Ryan? Sure. So stability values for California were about 38 Colorado's 42, Texas was 48. Oh, no. no that, that makes is, that makes sense. Yeah, that so, makes perfect sense. Sorry, yeah. I was just remembering those incorrectly. Yeah, so lowest values for California for stability, and they had the highest percent air voids. And I don't know which one correlates better to what happens under a, a typical roller condition. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that, that each of those states probably think that their method is the more accurate, or we probably wouldn't have three, <laughs> three methods of compaction. Just a guess. I'm not really sure how that all evolved. Well, I'm looking in at the sample types and tests lists on the website for these because, again, I'm trying to follow along and I'm lost. But I do notice that for the California needing compaction, there are no state test methods listed there. But for the Texas and Colorado, they do seem to have state methods listed under there. Is there any explanation to that, or can you expand on why that is? They created the test method. So Francis Veeam from Caltrans invented that test method, and his method was the eventual test. You know, and then these other states figured out different methods of compaction that they liked, and that but they still liked the Veeam methodology for for getting that stability test at the end years ago i wrote this article that's on our website about francis veem after talking to uh, phil stolarski uh, formerly of caltrans and he told me about francis veem and he had a really nice story and so we published this little story about francis veem which was basically just taken from things that i learned about him or read about him so it was almost like a book report uh, that I would have written in. <laughs> All of the literature school. review, Brian, it sounds better. Yeah, yeah. It was a good way to tell the story that had been forgotten. And actually, the information that I got it from was something that would be almost impossible to find. So it does kind of create promotion of that legacy of Francis Veeam's 
career, which I think was was a good thing to do. And I actually got a call from his daughter and she said how much she enjoyed it. I was a little nervous when I got a voicemail from her. So I was like, uh oh, I wonder <laughs> I wonder what this is going to be. But she said she really enjoyed it and it would it made her feel good. So I, that made me feel good. That That's still the like probably the best thing I've ever done because of that reaction that I got uh, professionally. Anyway, I will link to that article in the show notes as well. And as soon as you started talking about that, answering my question, Brian, I recalled that article, but it was from 2014. So it took a minute to remember that it, that's what that was from. So thank wow. you for that. Though. Nine years ago. I can't mm-hmm. believe it was that long ago. Now let's go to Joe for a minute. We've talked about the results. Let's talk about what happens on the accreditation side. What do people typically stumble on as far as uh, repeat low ratings are concerned on the Veeam samples? Not submitting data. Not Uh, submitting data, still still undefeated. The Veeam samples, and I'm sure this will continue with these two, uh, well, the three now, they usually don't generate very many accreditation suspensions for us, which which is great. As far as things to look out for, what I talked about with the Marshall sample with the paraffin parafilm standards being suspended along with bulk specific gravity, if that's suspended, laboratories need to submit data for both the uncorrected and corrected stability values. And we do assess both of those. Really, that's it for these. Something that John and I talked about last week with the sample was we will probably on future samples be removing or lock the vacuum sealing bulk specific gravity from this because there just doesn't seem to be enough laboratories in the Veeam sample that perform or lock. It's very few. I think we found two labs that only compact using Veeam and had core lock, so they, they might be impacted a little bit, but for the most part, we just, there didn't seem to be a lot of value in keeping that in this sample. So that might be a change. John, do you have anything more on that? Thanks for summarizing that up. I mean, we we actually had to have our IT manager go into the data analysis and uh, populate fake data for some of our, uh, if you want to call them dummy labs that we have here at Resource to uh, allow the analysis to be conducted. And we basically ran the analysis and suppressed right away uh, just because of the lack of data and participation. So that'll be a change for next year. We'll probably remove the uh, T331. I don't remember what the ASTM is, but the D6752 is the ASTM. One last question I had for you, John, about these results. Did you see any particularly high percent 1S values? Uh, I don't know if coefficient of variation is the proper term for that, but it's a it's a related term to the percent one s, or is it the term? Uh, it's it's the term, the coefficient of variation or percent one s. It's the yeah, same okay. thing. Kim's upset. I yeah. know. I really just, as soon as you started talking, glazed over. It's yeah. statistics are not, I'm just like, that just seemed way confusing. So I apologize that the look on my face that our listeners can't see was me just being glazed over of no clue imagine. what you're talking about. But no, oh, to, just to answer Brian's question, no, it didn't appear to be any different than any other round. Um, you know, Ryan tracks the stability and performance. Sorry, not the Veeam stability, the stability of the samples throughout the round for our ISO accreditation. Um, and what he mentioned a little bit ago, we didn't see any variation or any major deviation from that. Um, so it appears to be a, a, another normal round that was satisfactory. Well, that's good. And and I do want to uh, apologize to Ryan, not for getting his title wrong, but for, for getting the uh, the title of the test result wrong. I was calling it stability. I should have been calling it the stableometer value. I mean, it's so, a it's an easy uh, crossover there. Um, but yeah, I use the term stability day in day out for something completely different. So, well, yeah. I was having a hard time following along as well, looking for stability in yeah. the list of test methods. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. So that was helpful there to put the correct term for that. Um, I did have a question for you all. Because this is samples one and two for the, since we broke them out, for the suspensions, I know we don't quite know who, we haven't run that analysis yet of who's getting suspended, but the data previously, this isn't like other first round samples, right? Like people will 
get suspended for things on these samples versus when it's a brand new thing. Is that correct? Yeah, Kim, this is very similar to what was that? 2021 when we switched from fine aggregate and coarse aggregate to aggregate gradation and gravity and aggregate degradation. The the tests are still there. The data is all still there. So this this isn't a new sample. These aren't really new samples. It's just that all of these tests were in a sim- previously squeezed into a single sample and we've just broken them out for better better analysis and also just uh, an easier way to to track ratings. All right, so it's more of a rebrand as opposed to a new thing. That is a good way to put it, yes. And I just want to make sure that was clear because I know sometimes when people see the one and two, like samples one and two, they're like, oh, this is a clean slate. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to get suspended, but that's not the case in this instance. No, that's that's a good point to bring up as well, Kim, uh, just to make sure that everyone is aware the data from previous rounds will pull through because it's not set up by specific sample scheme. It's set up by test property. So even though these are one and two, last year's samples, I think, were 77 and 78, if I remember correctly. So when you look at your compilation of statistics, you should see Veeam 77, 78, and then HCO 1 and 2, HCA 1 and 2, HTX 1 and 2. So people's performance charts and stuff like that, it's all going to be awesome. Yep, they'll pull right through. Yeah, something we thought we were going to break during the uh, transfer for the the aggregate samples, but fortunately it works. (laughs) Yeah, that's great. Any any final thoughts about this round from anybody? I've got one final thought, not so much about the round, but for Veeam testing itself. This is a question we get pretty often. Uh, if If a standard is withdrawn, do we keep accrediting for it? And the answer is yes. So currently, California Needing Compactor, the, the ASCM version 1561 is a withdrawn standard. I believe 1560, it would need to be updated by the end of this year before it becomes a withdrawn standard. And, and I don't think there's much work going on with that. Brian once said to me when I asked that, him that question, he said, specifiers be specifying. So as long as a specifier for projects wants labs to run that standard, even if it is withdrawn, as long as labs want to maintain accredited for it, and there's a good number of labs that want to do so, we will keep offering the accreditation services, even if it's a withdrawn standard. So if you pull up the ASTM and you see those big red letters, withdrawn standard, that's not going to impact your accreditation. We're not going to withdraw it or anything like that. Thank you for that, Joe. That's a good point. So I, I think that's it for now. That's probably enough on those. I didn't get into how to make the Veeam samples because it's pretty much the same process as the Marshall, so we didn't need to belabor that. But I want to thank John Molesky, Proficiency Sample Program Director, Ryan LaQuay, Laboratory and Testing Manager, and Joe Williams, Heirloom Quality Analyst. Thank you. <laughs> Copyright it, John it. Molesky, 2023. Thanks for listening to Ashto Resource Q&A. If you'd like to be a guest or just submit a question, send us an email at podcast at ashtoresource.org or call Brian at 240-436-4820. For other news and related content, check out Ashto Resource's social media accounts or go to ashtoresource.org.